I am Dr Val Turner from the Royal Perth Hospital Accident and Emergency Department. I'm an emergency physician. What evidence authenticates a positive HIV antibody test as proof of HIV infection? This question has greatly interested me because those of us who work in emergency medicine spend a considerable part of our lives exposed to other people's blood and body fluids, a circumstance which, according to the experts, places us under threat of death from AIDS. Ironically, if the experts are right, the life we save may cost us our own, and it's little wonder that some of us have pursued AIDS science to the very limits. From the early days of AIDS, I was fortunate to, to collaborate with Eleni Eliopoulos, a biophysicist at the Royal Perth Hospital, and other colleagues. In one of our papers, published in June 1993 in the journal Biotechnology, we were compelled to confront many unsettling conclusions about the HIV antibody tests, none of which accord with current wisdom. Some of these I would like to share with you, the list is of Occam's razor. The HIV antibody test does not detect a virus. They test for any antibodies that react with an assortment of proteins experts assure us are unique to HIV, which, almost everyone agrees, is a retrovirus and is the cause of AIDS. What happens is this. A sample of blood is incubated with a mixture of these proteins in a test called an ELISA, an acronym for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. The ELISA is positive if the solution changes colour, thereby indicating a reaction between the proteins and the patient's antibodies. However, according to the experts, the ELISA is not too specific and may react in the absence of HIV infection and thus, if positive, is repeated and, if still positive, warrants a third but different test called the Western blot. In the Western blot, the proteins, about 10 of them, are located at discrete spots in a paper strip rather like the one your doctor uses to test your urine. Serum is added, and wherever there is a reaction, a colour change occurs which shows up as a dark band. The test is read by noting which bands show up, in other words, which proteins are reacting. Certain combinations of bands are defined as positive tests, and this is said to definitely prove HIV infection. What is strange is that the location and number of bands required for a western blot varies around the world and may even vary between laboratories within the same city. In Australia, four bands are required. In Canada and much of the United States, three bands suffice. In Africa, two will do. If each indicates HIV infection, then HIV must cause different populations of antibodies to appear in different places. I don't know about you, but to me that sounds very odd. Can HIV navigate? But at least it gives some Africans a way out. All an African has to do is have the test in Australia, because two bands will not be considered positive here. The explanation given for positive antibody tests is the immune system's ability to detect foreign agents and to react by producing antibodies directed against that agent. But it doesn't always work out like that. You're not necessarily infected with whatever your antibodies tell you. For example, the antibody test for glandular fever relies on the fact that patients with glandular fever make antibodies to the red blood cells of sheep and horses. But these patients are not infected with animal blood, and animal blood does not cause glandular fever. Bearing this example in mind, can we simply deduce that people are infected with what is regarded as a lethal human retrovirus just because we find an obliging antibody or two? Or should we expect that the vast AIDS literature can come up with more solid proof of precisely why those western blot bands light up? Don't forget that biology is not mathematics, and despite all our clever technology, in biology we must still stoop to the relative ignominy of empirical proofs. Sir William of Ockham was exceedingly fond of simplicity, and in that spirit I put it to you that you can only glean two pieces of information from an antibody test. Either you see a reaction or you don't. That's all, pure and simple, like a binary code. You certainly don't see antibodies with little labels attached saying what produced them. All you see is a colour change evincing a reaction. The essential problem is this. Did you know that antibodies indulge in casual and indiscriminate relationships? Yes, they are promiscuous. Antibodies meant for one agent may react with another, a perfect stranger. Here is some proof. In a study of 1.2 million applicants for US military service, of the 1% or 12,000 who had first Elisa's positive, only 2,000 were ultimately shown to be Western Lot positive. That leaves 10,000 illegitimate Elisa's, a fitting testimonial to the problem caused by cross-reacting antibodies. I hope this makes my point clear, because in a nutshell, this is the cardinal problem scientists face when ascribing meaning to any set of antibody reactions. How can you tell whether the antibody is the real thing or a ring-in, one whose proper partner is something else but caught in a compromising act? In this context, as is proper for a disinterested scientist, 
you would also have to allow for the possibility that there are no real HIV antibodies whatsoever, that they're all pretenders. You see, while we can predict in advance that a microbe will generate particular antibodies which react against it, we cannot deduce the reverse merely by observing a reaction. All reactions look the same, and that, as I said, is all you get from a test. So, if you want to claim an antibody reaction establishes a particular outcome, first you have to prove it. And just before we get to crunch time, consider this little morsel. AIDS patients have antibodies reacting with dozens of different substances, and it makes perfect sense that the more antibodies there are, the more chance there will be some that will spoil your test. What this means is that in the very patients you suspect of harbouring a virus, there exists the precise circumstances making it imperative to sort out what is really going on. Well, the solution. We can arrive at it by common sense, really. The problem is, how do you know when you see an antibody reaction, that is a positive test, a virus is present too? After all, the question on the patient's lips is bound to be, is there anything else that might cause this reaction? Whatever it is, I'd rather have that, thank you very much. In technical terms, the patient's hopes are hanging on the specificity of the test. This means if we test, say, a thousand people who somehow we know are not HIV infected, how many will have a reaction despite the absence of HIV? To find this out, and this shall be done well before the tests are introduced into clinical practice, we need to perform a validation experiment where we simply count the numbers. How many antibody reactions when there is no virus? But how do we find out about the presence or absence of the virus? Obviously we can't use the test because that's what we're trying to validate. No, it has to be something else, something independent of the test. We might, I suppose, entertain doing what AIDS experts repeatedly do and select a thousand or more bionic people such as military recruits or blood donors and simply assume because they are healthy, none are infected with HIV. And if this is done, certainly there will be few, if any, positive reactions. But that's not necessarily because the tests are highly specific. It's because p healthy people don't have lots of antibodies to react and spoil the test in the first place. That goes with being a healthy person. That's why we put them in the army and let them donate blood. There are simply not enough antibodies available to measure the propensity for unwanted reactions. It's like going to a party where there's hardly anyone hogging the savouries because there's hardly any people present. Anyhow, who says some healthy people aren't infected with HIV? But back to the problem of validation. Aha, you say, we can get around this. Let's select a thousand people who are sick and let's make sure we include some who have diseases similar to AIDS but not AIDS. All these people would have lots of antibodies and this will surely give the test a run for its money. There will be a lot more people at this party. Well, this is a much better idea, but hold on. If HIV causes AIDS and some of your patients have AIDS-like diseases, or even if they don't, how do you know that some of them are not actually infected with HIV? You don't want to include them because you want to know how often the test is positive when there is no HIV infection. I know by now many of you will have the correct answer. It's obvious, isn't it? You have to use HIV itself. You simply divide your blood sample in two, one to test for the antibody reactions and the other to try and isolate HIV. If you want to know what the HIV antibody tests tell you about HIV infection, you compare the reactions with what you are trying to measure, and not with pumpkins. The only way to distinguish between real reactions and cross-reactions is to use HIV isolation as an independent yardstick or gold standard. What are the results of such an experiment? How many of an appropriately chosen thousand patients from whom HIV cannot be isolated at the same time have an antibody reaction? I can't tell you that because, bizarre as it may sound, 12 years since the discovery of HIV, this experiment has not been done. We don't know how many positive tests occur in the absence of HIV infection. It might be none, or it might be all of them. There's no data. Nobody knows. What if somebody decided to do this experiment? Is it feasible? That's hard to say because it depends on how much importance you place on the precision of defining HIV infection, which ultimately can only be defined by the isolation of a unique retrovirus. According to the dictionary, the word isolation comes from the Latin word insulatus, meaning made into an island, and refers to the act of separating an object from everything else that is not that object. For retrovirus isolation, a set of rules was laid down in 1973 at the Pasteur Institute, which credibly achieves this aim of separateness. The problem is that no claim of HIV isolation yet presented fulfills either the island concept or the Pasteur Institute rules. All claims of HIV isolation are based on a set of phenomena detected in tissue culture, none of which are isolation and none of which are in fact even specific for retroviruses. And without isolation, who can say what proteins or anything else is unique to a microbe? Yes, I know that we have all seen pictures of something called HIV, but that should come as no surprise because, if you look carefully, retrovirus-like particles are commonplace in biology. 
They can be found in healthy human placentas, for example. And while it is true that electron microscopy reveals retroviral-like particles in 90% of enlarged lymph nodes from AIDS patients, the identical particles can also be found in 90% of enlarged lymph nodes from patients who do not have AIDS. If the particles seen in lymph nodes from AIDS patients are HIV, as the AIDS experts assure us, what are the particles seen in the lymph nodes of patients who are not at risk from AIDS? Wait on, I hear some more of you cry. What about the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR? For those of you who don't know, this is a new and very sensitive technique for finding genetic blueprints. Surely this can put us straight about the antibody tests. Not so, I'm afraid. For a start, the PCR detects at best single genes and most often only bits of genes. If your PCR finds two or three genetic fragments out of a possible dozen complete genes, is this proof that you have all the genes, the whole genome? No, it is not. And in fact, HIV experts admit that the majority of HIV genomes studied are incomplete. They are defective and could never orchestrate the synthesis of a viral particle. But even if all genomes were complete, let's not imagine that having the plans means you've built the house. And basic virology long teaches us that you can carry a whole retroviral genome around inside your cells all your life without ever making a viral particle. And in 1992, in the only study of its type, French researchers found the HIV PCR non-reproducible and the agreement between the PCR and the antibody tests was found to vary between 40 to 100% and was especially poor when more than one genetic fragment was sought. In other words, the two tests don't fit. Where does this all leave HIV AIDS patients? Firstly, since almost all AIDS patients have been diagnosed HIV infected solely on the basis of antibody tests, we can argue that there is no proof that a single such AIDS patient is actually infected with a virus called HIV. Secondly, these tests provide no justification for giving such patients potentially toxic drugs like AZT on the basis that they are antiviral. The best that can be said for the HIV antibody tests is that in certain well-defined at-risk individuals, there is a correlation between antibody reactions and the propensity to develop and die of certain diseases, a set of circumstances we choose to call AIDS. On the other hand, if you're HIV positive, but not at risk, and you're healthy, any pronouncements on your likely outcome will be severely confounded by knowing you're a positive, a situation along the lines of 20th century bone pointing. And your health may suffer further from the use of various medications administered to kill a virus you may not have. The failure to verify the antibody tests against the gold standard of virus isolation is a serious failing, and in the absence of such validation, these tests should not be used to diagnose HIV infection. My name is Dr. Val Turner. I'm an emergency physician at the Royal Perth Hospital in Western Australia. For the past decade and more, I've been a member of a small group of scientists who have questioned the HIV AIDS hypothesis. Put simply, we have argued in many published scientific papers that HIV is not the cause of AIDS, and indeed, there is no proof that HIV exists. Some of you listening to this program may feel that such a viewpoint is quite preposterous, even crazy. Indeed, at one level, I would have to agree with your point of view. The HIV theory of AIDS seems as impenetrable as the principle of Archimedes and the laws of Newton and Einstein. But perhaps I could remind you of something attributed to the renowned theoretical physicist Niels Bohr, who said that some ideas are crazy, but also crazy enough to be true. Indeed, there is a strong historical precedent for arguing the non-existence of HIV. In the mid-1970s, Dr. Robert Gallo, the current US HIV scientist, claimed to have discovered the world's first human retrovirus, which he named HL23V. For five exciting years, this virus was presented as a breakthrough in the quest to discover the cause of leukaemia. However, in 1980, when it was proven that antibodies to HL23V resulted from everyday exposures to a host of non-viral factors, this virus suddenly disappeared from the annals of science. It is now regarded as a monumental and embarrassing mistake. It is never mentioned and no longer exists. It is the belief of the Perth group of HIV-AIDS dissidents that when there is 
widespread acknowledgement of the fact that antibodies to HIV arise in circumstances which have nothing to do with the virus, and we will argue that this is always the case, then there is no reason, no scientific reason, for continuing to believe in the existence of HIV. This is a view shared by others now. In the October 19th edition of the Toronto Star, a report appeared following a meeting organised by the local chapter of the 10,000 strong North American AIDS dissident group, HEAL, that stands for Health Education AIDS Liaison. The meeting was addressed by Nobel Laureate Biochemist and Molecular Biologist Dr. Curry Mullis, who described how for the past 10 years he has been unable to obtain an answer to the relatively innocuous question, where and what is the proof that HIV causes AIDS? Eventually, Mullis even challenged HIV's discoverer, Professor Luke Montagna of the Pasteur Institute, but to no avail. Let me read you Mullis's account of this conversation from the foreword he wrote for Peter Duisberg's book, Inventing the AIDS Virus. With a look of condescending puzzlement, Montagne said, Why don't you quote the report from the Centers for Disease Control? I replied, It doesn't really address the issue of whether or not HIV is the probable cause of AIDS, does it? No, he admitted, no doubt wondering when I would just go away. He looked for support to the little circle of people around him, but they were all waiting for a more definitive response, like I was. Why don't you quote the work on simian immunodeficiency virus, the good doctor offered. I read that too, Dr. Montaigne, I replied. What happened to those monkeys didn't remind me of AIDS. Besides, that paper was just published only a couple of months ago. I'm looking for the original paper where somebody showed that HIV caused AIDS. This time, Dr. Montaigne's response was to walk quickly away to greet an acquaintance across the room. Mullis was eventually led to the conclusion the reason there were no papers proving that HIV was the cause of AIDS was that there were no such papers. Nowadays, Mullis agrees with the Perth group. Quote, no one has ever isolated HIV. No one has a bottle in their lab called HIV. End of quote. Thus it is small wonder that the English science journalist Neville Hodgkinson has described the HIV theory of AIDS as the greatest scientific blunder of the 20th century. It may be helpful to recall that AIDS dates from 1981, when exponentially increasing numbers of gay men in several large US cities developed two previously rare diseases, the rapidly fatal fungal pneumonia, known as pneumocystis carini pneumonia, or PCP for short, and Kaposi sarcoma, a malignancy of the skin and internal organs. Following the discovery that many of these patients had low numbers of certain immune system cells, known as T4 lymphocytes, in their blood, AIDS became regarded as a consequence of immune deficiency. The problem then became one of finding out why the T4 cells were depleted. Given the scenario of promiscuity, it did not seem at the time unreasonable to postulate the action of a sexually transmitted microbe. The most favoured was a retrovirus because... Although these were enigmatic remnants and disease-causing orphans of the Nixon decade war against cancer, two were nonetheless believed to be genuine viruses and have a predilection for T4 cells. It was easy to propose that a putative AIDS-causing retrovirus could kill off T4 cells, leaving the body prone to opportunistic organisms and cancers, which normal human bodies readily resist. In 1983, Luke Montagne claimed to have discovered such a virus, sometime later called HIV. The same claim was also made a year later by Dr. Robert Gallo from the US National Institutes for Health. Since I want this to remain principally a scientific talk, I will deliberately avoid the polemics that occurred between the Pasteur Institute in Gallo's laboratory over whether Gallo misappropriated the French virus. Besides making the same discovery as Montaigne, Gallo also announced proof that HIV causes AIDS in the development of an antibody test. 
Later on, when antibodies to HIV were actively sought and found in individuals other than gay men, principally drug users and haemophiliacs, it seemed to clinch matters and the HIV theory has never looked back. Patients, physicians, public health officialdom embrace it with the zeal of true believers and nowadays HIV truly does look as secure as Archimedes, Newton and Einstein. To doubt the HIV theory really does beg the crazy question. The state of scientific serenity was not to last long. In 1987, the highly revered virologist Professor Peter Jersberg from Berkeley, California, published an invited paper in the prestigious journal Cancer Research. In this paper, he concluded that HIV does not cause AIDS. His principal argument at that time was there was insufficient HIV in insufficient T4 cells, even when patients were dying, to do harm. Duisberg calculated that the alleged number of T4 cells lost daily at the behest of HIV was about the same a man would lose cutting himself shaving. Such a low viral burden was an acknowledged fact, but reaction to Duisberg's bombshell immediately led to the closure of ranks and the marginalising and shunning of one of America's most outstanding scientific minds. Eventually, it deprived Duisberg of all research funding. Into this fray stepped Perth biophysicist Eleni Papadopoulos Eliopoulos. She had begun to research AIDS at its inception in 1981, and by the time Duisberg's paper appeared, she had already received two rejections from the scientific journal Nature for proposing an oxidative stress chemical non-infectious theory to explain the genesis of both low T4 cells and AIDS. The theory had the added bonus of explaining the several laboratory phenomena inferred, although mistakenly in Eliopoulos' view, as proof of the existence of HIV. In Eliopoulos' view, what united AIDS patients and those at risk of developing AIDS was not an infectious microbe, but excessive exposures to a variety of noxious chemical influences that had in common the ability to oxidise cellular constituents. This led to the gradual poisoning of the body in such a manner that it became vulnerable to particular diseases. On the one hand, while Duisberg posited HIV as real but harmless, on the other hand, Eliopoulos argued that the set of laboratory data inferred as HIV was an epiphenomenon. This was an idea considerably backed up by experimental evidence gathered in the retrovirological literature well before the AIDS era. Unfortunately, as debate on this point would predictably split the dissident camp, Eliopoulos and her colleagues long refrained from public debate with Duisberg over this particular issue. It was only in December 1995 when the British gay men's scientific magazine Continuum offered a prize of £1,000 sterling for a paper proving the existence of HIV that Duisberg and Eliopoulos finally engaged publicly in what began and has remained friendly polemics. To an outsider, much of the debate from both sides is shrouded in an almost impenetrable fog of virological, immunological, biochemical and molecular biological jargon. Someone wishing to fully comprehend the basic scientific issues must be prepared to spend months immersed in unfamiliar concepts and language. In Eliopoulos' view, this unpalatable fact has been a most significant factor in the preservation of the HIV protagonist hallowed ground at almost at zero effort. This, along with a leading journal editor's virtual refusal to publish and hence publicise dissension, means that the general public is lucky to ever find out there is a debate. The unconscious expectation that such censorship will be circumvented by fair and open-minded investigative journalism has been rendered virtually inoperable by the established experts inveighing against such intrusions on the basis of their own legitimacy, inciting threats to public health. Thus it is small wonder that the void has become populated by a variegated collection of scientists, including two Nobel laureates, as well as many non-professional scientists, academics, journalists, patients and relatives, and perhaps surprisingly to some, a fair number of gay men. 
Nonetheless, the patient and persistent efforts of this group are in reality spendthrift in relation to the established order of scientists and government and big business institutions. Over the past decade, the frustration felt by the authentic stakeholders has spurned numerous dissident organisations, magazines, books and television documentaries, including most recently a very strong resolve to bring the issue into courts of law. As far as the Perth group is concerned, for some time now our aim has been to force an adjudicated debate at an international level. The formation of a critical mass of people is the key to unlocking the power of public opinion required to bring about such an event. I would now like to discuss some of the scientific debate. And in doing so, I would like to introduce this topic with a quotation from A Brief History of Time by the theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking. A theory is a good theory if it satisfies two requirements. It must accurately describe a large class of observations on the basis of a model that contains only a few arbitrary elements, and it must make definite predictions about the results of future observations. To paraphrase these words, we could say, wrong predictions affirm bad theories, correct predictions make them powerful. If we assume that HIV does exist as a bony fide infectious that is a particle of appropriate constitution and appearances able to reproduce itself inside living cells, the HIV theory predicts that all AIDS patients will be infected with HIV, all AIDS diseases are caused by HIV, via sexual activity with prostitutes, HIV and AIDS will spread initially from its nucleus of gay men and drug users into the larger heterosexual community. HIV kills T4 cells. A vaccine will be forthcoming. An animal model of HIV infection causing AIDS will be developed. So far, none of these predictions has been fulfilled. AIDS can be legally diagnosed without HIV infection, which we'll discuss further in due course. HIV has not spread beyond the original risk groups. There is now agreement that Kaposi's sarcoma, one of the two diseases for which the retroviral hypothesis was first proposed, is not caused directly or indirectly, that is via immune deficiency, by HIV. There is no proof that HIV kills T4 cells. Few if any non-drug taking prostitutes are HIV positive. The world still awaits the vaccine predicted by the end of 1986. And although monkeys have been given copious quantities of HIV and become HIV positive, none have developed AIDS. In fact, this year US senators were contemplating how best to retire 1,500 chimpanzees bred for AIDS research and which are currently languishing in cages at an annual cost to the US taxpayer of $7.3 million. Let us contrast the HIV theory to the Heliopolis oxidative stress theory. The oxidative stress theory predicts the current demographic data, that is, similar for example to the non-infectious vitamin deficiency diseases pellagra and scurvy, HIV AIDS will remain confined to the original risk groups. It also predicts the risk of passive anal intercourse in both sexes an apparent loss of T4 cells from the bloodstream, HIV positive and AIDS patients being oxidised relative to normal individuals, the improvement in various HIV and AIDS parameters by the use of antioxidants, and a non-infectious animal model. Every one of these predictions has materialised. In addition to the failures of spread and the risk of passive anal intercourse in both sexes. Oxidative stress is well established by hundreds of papers, so much so that in the early 1990s the Pasteur Institute was advertising international scholarships to study the phenomenon. This year Luc Montagnier became the principal editor 
of a 558-page book devoted to oxidative stress in cancer, ageing and AIDS. The Eleopolis theory predicts a decline in T4 cells without cell death. According to the scientific evidence, there is no evidence that the T4 cells are even dead in AIDS patients, let alone killed by HIV. For example, in T4 cell cultures, the same number of T4 cells disappear regardless of whether one adds what is said to be HIV or merely the chemical stimulants obligatory to obtain the HIV. As Eliopoulos proposed at the beginning of the AIDS era, the T4 cell count may be low either because the T4 cells are selectively sequestrated in tissues removed from the bloodstream or because they are altered such that the antibody used to measure their numbers will no longer bind to their surface. An examination of the scientific data also reveals lack of proof that the low numbers of T4 cells are necessary or sufficient to produce the diseases characterising the clinical syndrome known as AIDS. This means, for example, that the AIDS diseases may appear in individuals who have T4 cell counts within the normal range or may never appear in individuals who have reduced numbers of T4 cells, even in those who have continuously profoundly diminished numbers of T4 cells. Thus, a decade after her 1988 Medical Hypotheses paper, we find experts such as Dr. Arthur Anderson from the US Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Disease and Dr. Ziv Grossman at the University of Tel Aviv taking Eliopoulos' ideas and using them to question the central tenet of the HIV theory, that is, virus-induced killing of immune system cells leading to AIDS. Nonetheless, and despite so much evidence to the contrary, the orthodox view remains firmly entrenched. In fact, since 1993, the low numbers of T4 cells has been enshrined in the 1993 CDC AIDS definition, whereby AIDS can be diagnosed without a disease. Consistent also with the Eliopoulos oxidative stress theory is the fact that the only animal model of AIDS is not infectious. Mice repeatedly exposed to foreign cellular proteins develop a dramatic depletion of T4 cells, Kaposi sarcoma-like tumours and abundant retroviral-like particles appear in their spleens. Thus, in the only animal model, AIDS diseases are followed by the production of retroviral-like particles and not the other way around. To the uninitiated, this may come as a surprise. However, it has been long known that retroviruses arise even in uninfected cell cultures because all cells contain retroviral genetic information inherited from parents. Humans are no exception. Of the 100,000 or so genes making up human DNA, that is the human DNA genome, at least 1% consist of endogenous retroviral information. This represents an amount approximately 3,000 times larger than the putative HIV genome. Such information is switched into production mode by the oxidative conditions that exist in the AIDS risk groups and by the oxidant chemicals which are obligatory in cultures to obtain HIV. The highly implausible notion that a single microbe could cause such a diverse collection of what now amounts to 30 disorders gained credence only because of an hypothesised link under the guise of immune deficiency. This meant low numbers of T4 cells, which Gallo nominated as the, quote, hallmark, unquote, of AIDS. However, even in 1981, there was no precedent for such an all-embracing synthesis. It was well recognised that the vast majority of people diagnosed with cancer are not immune deficient, and of those who are, many whose cancer can be surgically removed will recover their immunity. In other words, either cancer causes immune deficiency or some other factor or factors underlies both conditions. Likewise, virtually all people destined to develop most infectious diseases in the immediate future are currently immune competent. Their diseases may well depress their immunity, as they might other body organs and systems, but only for as long as it takes patients to recover. For Eliopoulos and our group, 
The proposal at Depressed Immunity is a prerequisite for AIDS resulted from the coincidental development of technology to count T4 cells just before the discovery of HIV. But since physicians and the general public alike are prone to uncritical, almost wishful acceptance of immunity as a panacea for all that is good and bad with health, immune deficiency was an idea that needed little justification within the HIV paradigm. The Perth group contend that it is possible to appreciate the failure of the HIV theory without delving into the difficult and tedious business of retroviral isolation. This can be done simply by examining many facets of the HIV theory and posing the question, what properties would a virus need to explain the observed data? As I hope to show you, it would need so many crazy properties that eventually from this many angled approach we gather an impetus to examine the more technical virological evidence. Let us take a look at the AIDS definition. The AIDS definition is set out by the US CDC as a quote CDC surveillance case definition for AIDS end of quote. The latest edition was in 1993. Using the AIDS definition it should be utterly impossible to arrive at a diagnosis of AIDS by any means that violates the HIV theory of AIDS. But this is not the case. In the OECD countries, including the US and Australia, using a CDC definition, AIDS can be diagnosed with Kaposi's sarcoma, which even Gallo accepts is not caused by HIV, in the absence of immune deficiency, without laboratory evidence of HIV infection and extraordinarily in the presence of negative results for HIV infection. If AIDS were physics, these data alone would send the whole theory back to the drawing board. Let us now consider some data related to blood transfusion. It seems watertight, doesn't it? An individual receives a blood transfusion three months later is HIV positive and by year's end is dead from AIDS. Conclusive proof that HIV causes AIDS? Of course not. 50% of HIV antibody positive American blood transfusion recipients die within one year of transfusion. That is true. But so do 50% of HIV negative transfusion recipients. In fact within three years 60% of the latter will be dead. If HIV antibodies are proof of HIV infection and HIV causes AIDS, then the risk of developing AIDS should be the same risk as becoming HIV positive. However, the risk of AIDS increases three to six times faster with the volume of blood transfused than does the risk of becoming HIV positive. Likewise, HIV positive transfusion recipients are 50 times more likely to develop AIDS within a year than HIV positive haemophiliacs. Clearly, even if HIV were necessary to cause AIDS, it cannot be the only factor. However, rather than treating these data as a scientific and moral imperative to examine the total HIV-AIDS hypothesis, experts chose instead to prop up an ailing theory by inventing the idea of cofactors. That is, factors other than HIV, which are necessary for HIV to produce AIDS. However, this is severely problematic as one is then faced with an array of possible causations under which it is difficult to judge the significance of any. Theoretically, HIV could be a minor factor given this scenario, or perhaps not a factor at all. It is instructive to realise that each year in the US approximately 4 million blood transfusions are performed. Amongst these, a significant number administered for the treatment of cancer and to patients who have or had had surgical procedures including organ transplants, infections, radiation, antibiotics, anti-cancer and steroid drugs and psychological stress. Any of these factors are associated with immune suppression, the development of AIDS-defining illnesses 
and death. Furthermore, blood transfusions themselves are immune suppressive and of course are only performed at hospitals. Interestingly, patients attending hospitals have a high rate of HIV antibodies even when patients in the well-known risk groups as well as patients with meagre risks such as trauma are excluded. St. Louis and his colleagues reported a study of 26 US hospitals and in some of these hospitals 20% of no known risk men and 8% of similar women aged 25 to 44 were found to be HIV positive. Transfusion of HIV negative blood may be followed by the development of HIV antibodies and transfusion of one's own externally irradiated blood has the same effect. From these data one cannot help but wonder whether HIV antibodies have anything whatsoever to do with exposure to a virus, or perhaps arise for some other reason, such as the foreign nature of transfused blood, or similar multiple and varied immune stimuli associated with whatever diseases underlie the need for transfusion. From here it is only a small step to an appreciation that individuals in all the AIDS risk groups, including the populations of developing countries, are likewise exposed. Since the only animal model shows that repeated injections of immune-challenging foreign proteins cause the development of AIDS-like diseases, as well as a variety of antibodies that react with the HIV proteins, the question actually arises, why does one need to invent HIV to explain AIDS? It is now time to examine some of the large amount of data concerned with sexual transmission of HIV. HIV AIDS is claimed to be bidirectionally sexually transmitted. Data to support this claim are not based on microbial isolation and contact tracing as is the orthodox practice for proving diseases are infectious and sexually transmitted, but on mostly retrospective studies. These studies include highly selected groups of individuals including gay and bisexual men, heterosexual men, and women including prostitutes. These studies compare specific sexual practices with the risk of being and rarely becoming HIV positive. The first studies reported naturally were on gay men. In 1984 Gallo and his colleagues showed that of eight different sexual acts, a positive HIV antibody test correlated only with receptive anal intercourse. They also found the more often a gay man has insertive anal intercourse, the less likely he was to become HIV positive. This of course is incompatible with an infectious cause. In 1986, Gallo and his colleagues reported they found no evidence that other forms of sexual activity contribute to the risk of becoming HIV positive in gay men. In an extensive review of 25 studies in gay men reported in 1994, the authors concluded that, quote, no or no consistent risk of the acquisition of HIV-1 infection has been reported regarding insertive intercourse, end of quote. In the West, again, the largest and most judiciously conducted prospective epidemiological studies, such as the multi-centre AIDS cohort study, so-called MAC study, of 4,955 gay men, have proven beyond all reasonable doubt that in gay men the only significant sexual act related to becoming HIV antibody positive is receptive anal intercourse. Thus in gay men, AIDS may be likened to pregnancy. It is sexually acquired by the passive partner, but is not sexually transmitted to the active partner. Significantly, the MAX study also showed that once a gay man becomes HIV positive, progression to AIDS is further determined by the amount of passive anal intercourse sustained after the alleged infection. This is contrary to all that is known about infectious diseases. One infection, and not repeated infections, is all that is necessary to cause disease. Indeed, in Australia, Although the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons considers HIV-positive surgeons to be infectious and should not perform invasive procedures or operations, 
they are permitted to provide these services to patients who have the same infection. Turning now to heterosexuals, the largest and best conducted studies in heterosexuals, including the European study group, show that for women, the only sexual practice leading to an increased risk of becoming HIV antibody positive is anal intercourse. The unidirectional transmission of HIV observed in OECD countries is supported by Nancy Paddian's 10-year study of heterosexual couples between 1986 and 1996. There were two parts to this study, one cross-sectional, the other prospective. In the first part, the constant per contact infectivity for male to female transmission was estimated to be 0.309, approximately 1 in 1,100. The risk factors for women were anal intercourse, having partners who acquired this infection through drug use, Padin interprets this to mean that the women may also be IV drug users, and thirdly, the presence of sexually transmitted diseases. It is known that antibodies to their causative agents may react falsely in an HIV antibody test. Of the HIV negative male partners of 82 positive female cases, only two became HIV positive, but under circumstances considered highly ambiguous by Padian. In the prospective part of the study, beginning in 1990, 175 HIV discordant couples were followed for approximately 282 couple years. At entry, one third used condoms consistently, and in the six months prior to their last follow-up visit, 26% of couples still consistently failed to use condoms. There were no seroconversions after entry, including in the 47 couples not using condoms consistently. Based on the two out of 86 men who became HIV positive in the first part of the study, the risk to a non-infected male from his HIV positive female partner was reported to be in the order of 1 in 9,000 per contact. From this statistic, one can calculate that on average, a male would need to have some 6,000 sexual contacts with an infected female to achieve a 50% probability of becoming HIV positive. At three contacts per week, this would take 56 years, or a lifetime. The notion that HIV is a virus which does not discriminate is also markedly inconsistent with the data obtained from studies of female prostitutes. Even if, as is widely accepted, by some unknown means a sexually transmitted infectious agent found its way into the promiscuous portion of the gay male population in certain large cities in the United States in the late 1970s, Given the facts that prostitutes are frequented by bisexual men, and at the very earliest safe sexual practices date from 1985, one would have expected HIV AIDS to have spread rapidly through prostitutes and thence to the general community. However, the prevalence of HIV antibodies amongst prostitutes is almost entirely confined to those who are drug users. Virtually all other prostitutes have not been and are not becoming HIV positive and there are many studies in the literature to support this claim. For example, in Spain, of 519 non-intravenous drug-using prostitutes tested between May 1989 and December 1990, only 12, that is 2.3%, had a positive test, which was, quote, only slightly higher than that reported five years ago in similar surveys, end of quote. Some prostitutes had as many as 600 partners a month, and the development of a positive antibody test was directly related to the practice of anal intercourse. The authors also noted, quote, a more striking and disappointing finding was a low proportion of prostitutes who use condoms at all times, despite the several mass media AIDS prevention campaigns that have been carried out in Spain, end of quote. In 1991 in Australia, investigators from the Sydney Sexual Health Centre commented, quote, there has been no documented case of a female prostitute in Australia becoming infected with HIV through sexual intercourse, end of quote. Yet the authors maintained, quote, there are still many women working as prostitutes in Sydney who remain seriously at risk of HIV infection, end of quote, and recommended, quote, more widespread use of barrier methods of contraception, intensified efforts to prevent the sharing of needles, 
close monitoring of the health of prostitutes and scientific study of their paying and non-paying sexual partners, end of quote. In 1994, a report appeared of 53,903 Filipino prostitutes tested between 1985 and 1992. 72, that is 0.01%, were positive. In studies where there appear to be a high incidence of HIV amongst prostitutes, there are data that defy explanation. For example, although HIV has been present in the commercial sex work networks in the Philippines and Indonesia for almost as long as it has been in Thailand and Cambodia, the prevalence of HIV in the former is 0.13% and 0.02% and 18.8% and 40% in the latter. If these data are accurate, the discrepancy defies explanation and has indeed baffled the experts, although the latter postulate behavioural factors such as one country's prostitutes and clients being considerably more or less sexually active. Interestingly, since 5,674 and 4,360 of the 12,785 Cambodian HIV and AIDS case reports till the end of December 97 are listed as unknown gender and unknown age, respectively, data collection, at least by the World Health Organization in Cambodia, must be regarded as severely problematic. Why should HIV avoid non-drug-using prostitutes? If female prostitutes who do not use drugs do not become HIV infected despite being seriously at risk of HIV infection, what is the risk of infection to the majority of women who are neither drug users nor prostitutes? According to data from the Australian National Centre in HIV Epidemiology and Clinical Research, vanishingly little. In 1989, a study reported 10,217 blood samples taken from newborn babies. Newborn babies are regarded as unambiguous evidence of unprotected heterosexual activity. No babies were HIV positive. Since newborn babies can only be infected by their mothers, if heterosexual women remain non-HIV infected, how do their non-drug using male heterosexual partners become infected? According to Simon Wayne Hobson, a leading HIV expert from the Pasteur Institute, quote, a virus's job, end of quote, is to spread. If you don't spread, you're dead. The overwhelming evidence from studies both in gay men and heterosexuals is that HIV AIDS is not bi-directionally sexually transmitted. In the whole history of medicine, there has never been such a phenomenon. Since microbes rely on person-to-person -person spread for their survival, it is impossible to claim from epidemiological data that HIV AIDS is an infectious sexually transmitted disease. Unless one is prepared to entertain the notion of a microbe capable of distinguishing the habits, organs and countries of those engaging in sexual contact, the epidemiological data alone are sufficient to question the existence of HIV antibodies and HIV. I would like to conclude this talk with a rather brief look at the HIV proteins and antibody tests. A more Extensive treatment of this topic can be found in a subsequent talk. It is important to realise that the presence of HIV in humans is not diagnosed by viral culture and isolation, but indirectly by seeking out antibodies in blood which react with a number of proteins deemed unique to HIV. This logic relies on the fact that foreign material introduced into a human being evokes the production of antibodies by certain cells of the immune system. The finding of these antibodies is considered proof that such exposure has taken place. If there is such a thing as HIV, and such things as HIV-specific proteins, that is, proteins which form the unique body parts of the HIV particle, then these proteins should only be found in people who are HIV-positive or who have AIDS. But all the principal HIV proteins have been discovered in health from healthy, no-risk, persistently HIV-negative humans, such as cells from the skin, the blood, the lymph nodes, the thymus, tonsils, and the placenta. 
Luke Montagna, the discoverer of HIV, claims that the P41 HIV protein is, quote, due to contamination of the virus by cellular actin, end of quote. Actin is a protein found in abundance in all cells. Indeed, to this day, Montagna does not recognise antibodies to P41 as evidence of HIV infection. The greatest amounts of the highly significant HIV P24 protein do not occur in AIDS patients at all. They occur in HIV negative organ recipients in the days and weeks immediately following transplantation. As the patient's health improves, the protein disappears, which it should not if it were from HIV, because HIV infection, we are told, is for life, and AIDS an inevitable consequence. Indeed, none less authority than Dr Philip Mortimer and his colleagues from the United Kingdom Public Health Laboratory Service accept that the HIV P24 protein is, quote, non-specific, end of quote. The data relating to the antibodies to the HIV proteins, that is, what makes a person HIV positive, are just as puzzling. There are numerous instances where humans, as well as other animals, have antibodies to the HIV-specific proteins, where now or never, experts agree there is no HIV. For example, although once infected, always infected, HIV-positive drug addicts who become drug-free and healthy lose their HIV antibodies. Mice and dogs have antibodies to HIV, yet both species spread neither HIV infection nor AIDS. In Australia, one quarter of healthy blood donors have antibodies to one or more of the HIV proteins. In the United States, 10% of individuals at low risk for AIDS, including, quote, specimens from blood donor centres, end of quote, had a positive HIV antibody test by the most stringent US criteria. Because of this, early on in the AIDS era, it proved necessary to redefine a positive antibody test in order to make it harder to be HIV positive. Otherwise, one in every four to ten individuals would be infected with HIV. On the other hand, although AIDS began to decline in 1987, this trend was countered by the addition of more and more diseases to the AIDS definition, making it easier to be diagnosed as AIDS. Nowadays, one does not even need a disease to be diagnosed as AIDS. Mere laboratory abnormalities suffice. The net effect of these changes was to maintain a correlation between the so-called HIV antibodies and AIDS amongst the risk groups, while the probability of an HIV-AIDS diagnosis outside these risk groups remained slight. This was accentuated by avoiding testing outside the risk groups. Thus, the proof that HIV causes AIDS, and the reason the HIV theory has flourished, is a contrived correlation between HIV antibodies and AIDS. What is particularly enigmatic is that even within this contrivance, the types and number of antibodies required to prove HIV infection vary all over the world. That is, they vary between laboratories, institutions and countries. Yet it is taught that HIV antibody testing is so highly specific, 99.39% in fact, that only one in a million times is someone HIV positive, not truly infected. However, if these wildly fluctuating criteria are valid, we must accept that HIV betrays its presence by causing different patterns of antibodies in different places. This is analogous to claiming a heart attack causes different electrocardiographic abnormalities in different parts of the world. If it is true for HIV, then HIV must be the first human microbe to navigate. These data also imply, for example, that a person who is HIV positive in New York City with two or three antibody bands will not be HIV positive when tested in Australia, or an HIV positive African in Africa will not be positive in San Francisco. Hence travel or immigration changes one's infective status. Since this is an extremely unlikely modus operandi for a microbe possessing only 10 genes, we are inexorably led to question whether HIV may in fact be the king's new clothes. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, eventually the nonsensical data forces us to an examination of the seminal experiments performed by Montaigne and Gallo in 1983 and 1984 to 
convince themselves and the world they had discovered a retrovirus HIV. In today's talk, I wish to summarise the data and not go into too many details. Fortunately, an extremely useful summary is to state that despite what everyone else has said, there is no proof that HIV has been isolated as an infectious particle. This means that nowhere in the scientific literature is there a logical stepwise account of an appropriate particle being purified, analysed and then added to fresh cells from which new but identical particles are obtained. This being the case, it is impossible to claim that a particular protein or proteins and RNA are HIV on the basis of extraction from a virus. The proof that HIV exists is attributed to a number of findings from cell cultures, none of which is specific even for viruses, let alone a specific retrovirus. Yes, I know we have all seen pictures of particles claimed to be HIV, but it is extremely important to know that from appearances it is impossible to claim that a particle is a virus. In cell cultures all manner of particles abound, none of which can be identified as viruses unless one isolates the particle, that is purifies it, analyzes its contents, places particles in a fresh cell culture and proves that the identical particle emerges. It is also problematic that the same HIV particle has been found in the same high proportion of both AIDS and non-AIDS patient lymphatic tissues and so too the fact that the HIV particle has been classified in three different genera and two subfamilies of retroviruses. This is analogous to claiming an animal is simultaneously human, a gorilla and an orangutan. Viral genetic material, that is RNA, responsible for the manufacture of viruses typically varies no greater than 1%, while in animals as different as humans and chimps it varies a mere 1 to 2%. But HIV RNA varies 10 to 40 percent. Evidence according to the experts how the clever virus mutates to escape the immune system in every new anti-HIV drug. However, such extreme variation can only be considered orders of magnitude more stupid than clever because it could not result in the replication of the same species of anything, virus or animal. From these data alone it makes it nonsensical to conclude that HIV RNA is a genetic endowment of a virus. If not a virus, then where do the HIV proteins come from, and what are they? At this year's International Geneva AIDS Conference, the Perth Group presented further data that the HIV proteins are cellular. Our argument is based upon an interpretation of experiments performed in monkeys with simian, that is monkey, immunodeficiency virus, CIV, a retrovirus said to be closely related to HIV. Researchers from the US National Cancer Institute show that monkeys immunised with cellular proteins devoid of sieve nonetheless are protected from infection when injected with actual sieve. This work confirms similar research carried out earlier by E.J. Stott in the United Kingdom in 1991. The majority of people appreciate that immunisation is specific. Immunisation with the measles virus, for example, does not protect a child from polio. Immunisation relies on specific interaction between the immune system and all or part of the actual organism against which protection is sought and which is the immunising agent. If cellular proteins alone present in the cell cultures used to prepare SIV protect animals from sieve, then logic demands that SIV and thus by inference HIV proteins are cellular proteins. This is also borne out by a comparative biochemical analysis of the sieve and cellular proteins which reveals an identical pattern with only quantitative differences. One of the many AIDS mysteries is the elapse of 14 years before any research group published an electron microscope picture of the material purported as pure HIV. Until March 1997 all published pictures had been obtained from cell cultures which were unpurified. Yet electron microscope pictures depicting purified particles is the first most essential step in attempts to prove particles are a virus. When these long-awaited pictures eventually appeared in the journal Virology, 
they reveal purified HIV to be a tangle of cellular debris. In fact, the authors themselves did not describe this material as pure HIV, but as purified cellular vesicles. Scattered amongst these vesicles are scant particles, which without evidence the authors claim are HIV particles, and which are, quote, contaminated by the cellular vesicles, end of quote, but which, quote, co-purify, end of quote, with the cellular material. Close examination of the HIV particles, as well as other evidence in the papers, show that they are too large, wrongly shaped, have too high a mass, and are devoid of the surface knobs HIV experts unanimously assert are absolutely essential for the HIV particle to latch onto an uninfected cell and infect it. Yet it is from such material that HIV AIDS experts and biotechnology companies obtain proteins and RNA by the ton to use in tests to pronounce humans infected with a unique exogenous AIDS-causing microbe. Based upon these data, many physicians recommend the administration of toxic and costly anti-HIV drugs, most often to people who are completely healthy. Rather ironically, the most devastating blow to the HIV theory of AIDS comes from its discoverer, Professor Luc Montaigne. On July the 17th, 1997, the French investigative television journalist Jamal Tahi interviewed Professor Montaigne in camera at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. Montaigne was asked, quote, why do the electron microscope photographs published by you in 1983 come from the culture and not the purification, end of quote. His reply was, quote, of course one look for it, one look for it in the tissues at the start, likewise the biopsy. We saw some particles, but they did not have the morphology typical of retroviruses. They were very different, relatively different. So with the unpurified cultures, it took many hours to find the first pictures. It was a Roman effort. Charles Dorget, an electron microscope expert, looked at the plasma, the concentrate, etc., he saw nothing major. End of quote. Questioned about the Gallo group's efforts, Montaigne replied, quote, Gallo, I don't know if he really purified. I don't believe so. End of quote. Since Montaigne admits he saw no retroviral-like particles in his purified virus, this should have been both the beginning and the end of HIV. All HIV AIDS dissidents live in the hope that one day, possibly soon, we will have a real debate. Dissident HIV scientist Philip Johnson, Professor of Law at Berkeley, California, has commented on how HIV experts are unwilling to take seriously anything that comes from outside their own interpretive community. Quote, They never even imagined that outsiders might base their scepticism towards purportedly scientific claims on the evidence. They are also oblivious to the problematical assumptions in their own thinking. Their only interest is in exposing the doubtless twisted motives that would cause anyone to doubt the truth that has been proclaimed by the authorities at the National Institutes for Health or the National Academy of Sciences. They will never be interested in learning about the issues until the power holders tell them to take it seriously. End of quote. More than anyone else, politicians realise the futility of trying to fool all the people all the time. Thus, it is inexorably drawing nearer to the time when world governments will convene an international adjudicated debate on this subject, in contrast to 13,775 participants from 177 countries who attended the June 1998 Geneva AIDS conference. This should be a small gathering where a dozen or so experts from each side put their respective cases to a disinterested group of scientists of the utmost stature. For example, Another dozen scientists made up largely of Nobel laureates. There is a precedent for such a consensus conference, in common sense, and along the lines of a model invented in Scandinavia and since applied in the United Kingdom and elsewhere. A jury of 14 people, screened for independence from interested parties, have issues debated in front of them by scientists, non-government organisations, industrialists and other bodies. The power of public research bodies is probably the best guarantee of independence with respect to private sector research and the influence of multinationals. By aid standards, funding for such a meeting would be trivial. Indeed, such would be its significance, it would make money for the organisers. Perhaps the disinterested observer could be forgiven for concluding that, 
although we are approaching the 18th year of the AIDS era and have spent many precious millions of ration dollars on treatments and research, the words of Peter Gisberg continue to taunt us. Quote, By any measure, the war on AIDS has been a colossal failure. Our leading scientists and policy makers cannot demonstrate that their efforts have saved a single life. End of quote. Perhaps those of Eliopoulos are of equal portent. Quote, the single most important obstacle in finding the explanation for AIDS is the belief in HIV. End of quote. In his recent book, Dancing Naked in the Minefield, Dr. Carrie Mullis writes, quote, Years from now, people will find our acceptance of the HIV theory of AIDS as silly as we find those who excommunicated Galileo. Indeed, it was Galileo who counselled in science, the authority embodied in the opinion of thousands is not worth a spark of reason in one man. Perhaps 17 years in, we should all pause, look around, and then take a long walk back. Thank you. <laughs>